Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the i3 podcast. I'm here today with Adrian Benner, who is the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer of Intech Investment Management, part of the Janus Henderson family. Adrian is also a former maths lecturer at Princeton University. Um, he's the author of the book, The Calculus Lifesaver. And last but not least, you're also a recorded musician playing the piano. How do you have time for all of this, Adrian? It's a bit of a juggling act. But I find that, for example, music really helps me to maintain my focus in other areas. So it's a wonderful release. My wife is a musician, so uh, we spend time together by playing music together. And now our children are following in our footsteps as well. So, Oh, what do they play? Well, my son is uh, just taking up the drums, I'm afraid. Uh, So the house has gotten a bit noisy and uh, my daughter is is a pianist as well. Yeah, and you you play uh, different types of music, um, probably some of the more well-known genres like jazz, um, but you also play a type of music called klezmer. What's what's that? Yes, the klezmer is uh, is basically Eastern European party music. It uh, it's uh, the music uh, synthesized from Eastern European Jews, gypsies, party goers in general. And the, uh, the spin that we put on it in my band is that we, we basically do a, a sort of a fusion with jazz as well, since, as you said, we're, uh, we're jazz musicians. So it's uh, very improvisational, uh, spur of the moment sort of stuff, great for dancing and a lot of fun to play. Yeah, so how, how did you find out about that music? Had you already always known about this? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think it really was on my radar in Australia, but uh, when I moved to, uh, to the States to do my PhD, um, I was in the jazz band at Princeton University while I was a, a graduate student, and I met a number of other musicians, and we had all heard a little bit about this sort of music, didn't really know what it was, but it was, uh, it was sort of exploring our roots because our families have all sort of come from that area. And at first we had no idea what we were doing, but we had the good fortune to study from some of the old masters uh, and, and, uh, and really try to get authentic before, of course, moving on to spoiling it, you might say, by introducing the jazz elements. We, we just, uh, we're just trying to make good music. So is there any sort of famous star of this style of music? Well, uh, not that many people would have heard of, but uh, Dave Tarras was one of the, the all-time great clarinetists, if I drop a name. Very good, very good. All right, let's talk uh, investments. Um, so you have a dual role of CEO and CIO at Intech. Um, how does that work? Was one role uh, too boring? <laughs> well, I came up through the investment side. Uh, my background is in mathematics. And uh, after I finished my PhD, I moved over actually to uh, to Intech across the road. So uh, Intech's investment office is, is literally across the road from Princeton University's campus. So I, having gone uh, a long, long way to study, I, I didn't have to go very far geographically uh, for my job. But uh, my first job was, in fact, in, in research uh, at, at Intech, which was quite small at the time. And uh, so I, I followed a progression of increasing seniority within the investments, uh, culminating in, in the chief investment officer role in 2012. Um, in terms of the, the, the CEO role, this is really a recognition that the business needs are really best served by aligning the investment needs 
with our clients' needs ultimately. And so it does sound like a lot to do and, and it is very demanding. Uh, but I do spend most of my time as a CIO and I try to be very good at delegating the critical functions, uh, the day-to-day -day management, you might say, of the CEO. I've, I uh, view my main role as CEO as a, as a strategic role rather than a day-to-day -day role. Yeah, And I, I should say I'm very fortunate to have really excellent people that I rely on on a day-to-day basis uh, in, in the management side. So the strategy that is used within the firm, it, it, it does have a lot of uh, grounding in mathematics. It's uh, basically a systematic uh, suite of strategies. It, it's based on the, the philosophy of the stochastic portfolio theory, which itself is derived from uh, modern portfolio theory. Can you tell us a little bit about how this influences your investment decisions? Yes, uh, excellent question. The, uh, the company was founded by Robert Fernholtz, who has a mathematical background. He came through uh, as an academic and uh, left academia, worked with Harry Markowitz. You mentioned modern portfolio theories, so and they actually collaborated. Although my understanding is they were looking more at currencies rather than uh, portfolios of, of stocks, for example. Um, uh, but uh, he, he had an insight, uh, made a discovery in 1982 that there was a way of taking modern portfolio theory and essentially trying to do it with the tools of stochastic calculus. So stochastic calculus is a scary sounding term. Stochastic is just a fancy word meaning random. And so a stochastic calculus itself is the calculus of functions. So calculus meaning how things change basically. So how do, how do functions change when the functions are themselves random? So for example, a stock price could be considered random in the sense that it's not very easy to predict what it's going to be doing a minute from now, a day from now, and so on. Uh, so if you took modern portfolio theory, which was really a single period analysis, assume that you know the stocks or the assets returns, expected returns, I should say, and the volatilities and, co and correlations for a particular period, then that's great. That's, the, that's where the theory applies. The problem is this is hard to estimate and you don't really always have a particular investment horizon. For example, if you are a superannuation fund manager, you, you probably have a very long-term investment horizon and you're probably not going to be able to estimate these quantities for the length of that multi-decade long time horizon. And so the insight that, that Bob Fernholtz had was that by applying stochastic calculus to modern portfolio theory to come up with stochastic portfolio theory, you could understand the role that compounding and rebalancing play, as opposed to forcing to have a buy and hold investment over a period. So this informs our entire thinking and our investment process is really based on these original insights. Although in the 37 years since that original paper was published, we've made quite a lot of both theoretical and practical engineering insights that have really led to where we are now. Yeah, and because it finds it roots within the, the modern portfolio theory, uh, there has been, I think recently, or in the last couple of years, quite a bit of criticism on the theory as well. Uh, some of it stemming from the fact that it assumes a normal distribution, partly also because um, it, it sees excessive gains as just as bad as excessive losses. Does the stochastic theory solve any of these problems? Yeah, I think it largely addresses these problems. Of course, it may introduce more problems, but uh uh, there aren't these sorts of normality assumptions. For example, if anything, the theory starts off by recognizing that for long-term investments, you're probably more interested in a compound return or a, what you might call a geometric or a logarithmic return. The terms are slightly different, but they all convey the idea that when you are dealing with an uncertain time horizon, uh, you will be very disappointed if you take a simple average of your returns because you will find that your compound return, 
will, will be lower if there's any volatility. So this, I think, is the main problem with modern portfolio theory. And to be fair, it was never designed to be any sort of universal theory. It is, it's a very useful theory if you, if you take it over a fairly short time horizon. Compounding, it becomes more tricky. And so I think, yes, you could almost say that stochastic portfolio theory was created to address some of the shortcomings, uh, not so much uh, design flaws, but just the, the uh, simplicity of modern portfolio theory. Now, I remember an, um, a story that apparently Harry Markovich invested his own money just based on a equal weighting 50-50 split equity bonds and never really used his own theory to apply it to his own personal situation. How about you? Do you do equal weighting? I don't exactly do equal weighting. I, uh, I have a, a decent chunk of my assets in my own funds, like... Uh, uh, fund managers should, right? Um, uh, but I do try to keep it pretty simple, actually. The 50-50 weighting um, would have the virtue of rebalancing. And so when any of the assets do particularly well, it's great to lock in the gains uh, because you will otherwise uh, succumb perhaps to what I sometimes call the curse of compounding, which is really a, a it's really at the heart of, of, of compound returns and stochastic portfolio theory itself. So the concept is, is this. If you have a gain and you don't do anything, then you have more at stake. So you're more susceptible to a loss. And in the other direction, if you have a loss and you don't do anything, then any gain is starting from a smaller base to work with. So a classic example of this is that if, if you're invested in, a, in an asset, say it has a, a value of $100, and it goes up 25%, fantastic, you're at $125. If you don't collect that gain and reinvest and re-diversify, then you're less diversified than you were, assuming that this is part of a bigger portfolio. And uh, even a 20% negative return on that 125 will get you back to the 100 so you would think mathematically that 25 minus 20, I hope my kids can tell me that that's five, but actually it's zero from in the mathematics of compounding. In the other direction, of course, if you started with $100 and you lost the 20% first, you'd be down to 80, but then you need a 25% return on the $80 base to get back up to the 100. So actually, if you keep taking your gains and reinvesting, uh, then you can you can break this. Uh, you can actually improve your compound return. So if your strategy was as simple as, say, rebalancing between 50-50 uh, equities and, and bonds, then uh, at least you're maintaining diversification and improving your compound return. So I'm not saying I advocate that, but I, 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 see, I see a philosophical uh, similarity in the general approach yeah. of rebalancing a portfolio. Yeah. So the rebalancing is very important to, I think, uh, the underlying investment philosophy uh, at Intech. And I remember that I read something where you said this also explains to a degree uh, what we know as this uh, size premium. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, size is, a, is, uh, is obviously considered a premium or sometimes a factor. And uh, it, it's Actually, of all of the different factors that you can look at, it is the one that's most directly connected with returns. So it makes it particularly easy to analyze. In that, if a small stock becomes big, it's basically, it, it, it has to have had a good return. It has to have had a market beating return, essentially. Otherwise, it would still be small. Vice versa, why do large stocks become small? They lag the general population of stocks. Otherwise, they would keep their place and remain large. So if you think of the sort of trading that you need to do to maintain a mega cap portfolio, say you wanted to hold the top 50 stocks within the S&P 500. So that's 10% of the names, but it's typically around half of the capitalization because the S&P 500 is quite concentrated at the top end, mega cap end. So if you always wanted to maintain the top 50, suppose you come back a month later and you discover that five out of those 50 are no longer in the top 50. They've dropped down a little bit. 
Well, that's probably because they've underperformed the general collection. If they had kept up, then they would likely still be in that top collection. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to sell them. And then you have to buy other stocks. So this is a sort of anti-rebalancing because you've actually sold low. You've sold your recent losers, at least relative losers, and you've bought stocks that have recently outperformed other stocks. That's why they've made it into the top part of the race, as it were. So the large, maintaining a very large cap portfolio is sort of like an anti-rebalancing. By the same token, though, uh, maintaining the small cap portfolio re requires selling a lot of recent winners that have recently become large and buying some recent losers that were large and are now small. And th this is actually a very beneficial set of trades that you can do. So this is a connection that you might think between rebalancing and, and a smaller cap effect. So once you realize that it's there, you can start to study it. And yes, the mathematics can get a little bit hairy. Uh, it really does uh, rely on tools from stochastic calculus, which are typically graduate level courses. Um, I've had the good fortune, of course, to, be, uh, to, to have studied this, and uh, it's a really a, a beautiful theory. Um, if you apply it to this aspect, then you can start to understand that for this sort of premium, there are stock type effects and there are portfolio level effects. And this I don't think is very well appreciated. Certainly, Intech is not the only group to appreciate this. We've published, others have published, many people are aware of this. We just say that if you look at something like size or any other factor premium, ask yourself, when you look at the long-term historical performance, how much of that performance is coming from properties of the individual stocks? And how much is coming from the trading that you do to maintain the rules that you've set? And we contend that for most of these things, it, it, it isn't just stock effects. And for size, it's basically not stock effects at all. Individual small stocks do not outperform individual large stocks. Trading to maintain a small stock portfolio is a good trading strategy. So should we call it the turnover premium rather than the small size or the size premium? Ah, uh, but it matters which trades you do, right? Remember the example of the large stocks, there you are consistently buying high and selling low. So that's sort of bad turnover. Whereas if you can do the opposite, you can buy low and sell high then that has a more rebalancing-like flavor, right? You're, you are uh, essentially trimming your winners and investing in your losers. Hard to do, of course. It's extremely counterintuitive. People don't like losers. They want to get out of them. That's why so many people got out of equities in the end of 2008 through 2009. So, of course, some people had to use equities as a source of liquidity, but... Uh, the big sell-off was exacerbated. And that was really the worst thing you could do, right? You want to try to, when something goes on sale, right? You want to go and buy it. You don't really want to try to get rid of it. Uh, and yet that's, uh, investors aren't always wired to, to, to behave that way. And it, and it is hard to do. Yeah. The other um, important part, I think, uh, for your strategy is, is volatility. We've seen recently a lot of interest in low volatility strategies, but I think you're focusing more on periods where the volatility is high. Yes, this is a good question. So uh, there is a very strong relationship between how well rebalancing actually works uh, and the volatility of the stocks underlying. If the stocks themselves all behave like each other, then there isn't really a lot of movement. So think about this example of just the 50-50 equity fixed income uh, portfolio, right? So if you're 50% equity and 50% bonds, if equities and bonds always had the same return, no matter how volatile that was, if they always had the same return, you'd never have to trade it at all. You would be frozen at a 50-50. So really it's the relative volatility of the two things moving against each other that creates the trades that lead to a rebalance. And so when we look at volatility in the stock market, we have this idea that from the point of view of rebalancing, the absolute volatility of the stocks doesn't really matter. What really matters is 
how do the stocks move against each other? So we would tend to favor stocks that look different from other stocks. The interesting thing is, those stocks could themselves have lower volatility than the average. They just behave differently. So for example, if the market's up 10%, might only be up 5%. If the market's down 10%, they might only be down 5%. That is a lower volatility stock that nonetheless still is going to behave differently from the other stocks in the portfolio. So we look for high idiosyncratic volatility, if you will. But we actually do offer low volatility portfolios as part of Intex product, product offering. That's not the only sort of portfolio. But we have uh, probably around 20% of our assets are in some sort of defensive equity. So even though we prefer the high relative volatility, we can still be completely consistent with the investment thesis on the return side by doing a defensive portfolio on the risk side. So as you can imagine, this takes a little bit of time to explain, but uh, if you think about it, it can be completely uh, self-consistent. And I was thinking about a lot of systematic strategies have only really come about in sort of the last 10 years where they've been implemented. And we also have seen a period where there has been relatively low volatility. How do you think these type of strategies will act once we get into uh, an environment where we are not dominated by sort of the, the macroeconomic environment with quantitative easing? I'm not sure we'll ever have an environment like that, actually, <laughs> the way things are going. But I guess that's a pretty strong statement. Uh, things will will always be different in the future and not in ways that are necessarily predictable or even repetitive of, of anything that's uh, that's occurred in the past. So uh, there, of course, have been quantitative strategies for decades, but I think what we've seen, particularly in the last 10 years, is the rise of low-cost factor investing, which uh, could be, of course, implemented in, in funds as overlays and, of course, as ETFs as well. And so it's a very wide ecosystem. And in any period, some of these funds are going to do well, and some of them are not going to do so well. Uh, there's just so many of them, and there are so many dip different implementations of them that it's very hard to put your hands around them and say, okay, well, this is, these are all going to do the same thing. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the ones that have been very thoughtful in their construction, recognizing the dangers of, for example, excessive turnover, overcrowding, market structural shifts, and so on. So I think some of the smart beta type of strategies are indeed smart. And there's an awful lot that when you pop the hood, as it were, look at the underlying engine, there isn't a lot there. And so I would tend to think that the better design strategies, especially when they focused on risk control as well, would have a better chance of thriving in, in markets that, that change fairly quickly. Um, so this is always my advice to any investor, including myself, just just look at what it actually is and see if it makes some sort of sense. See if it's well designed, you'll have a better chance of withstanding the uncertain future. We've, we've uh, used a couple of terms, systematic strategies, smart beta. Um, I think I read somewhere that you prefer the term smart alpha. Is that true? Well, we've used this term to try to distinguish perhaps what Intech does from some of the more naive smart beta strategies, yes. Um, there is perhaps a blurring between quantitative strategies, systematic strategies, and smart beta. These terms are not all the same, but sometimes they're used uh, interchangeably. Um, I think if you can recognize that there is a portfolio level alpha that you can actually go after, you can say, I'm going to build a strategy where I'm not trying to predict which stocks will beat the market. If you're good at that, my hat's off to you. I think mathematically it's very difficult to do that. Not impossible, but very difficult. But there is this rebalancing premium, this trading profit that is accessible. And if you know that it's there and you can exploit it, then you can actually see that you've created alpha from it. And so if you do that well, maybe that is a, a good reason to say that this could be called smart alpha.
But I was interested in, in some of the research, um, and I think you have looked at this as well, that when you try to look for a particular premium, sometimes they put in completely random type of strategies or uh, naive strategies. They still seem to be doing better than the market uh, index. Why is that? Is, is anything better than the market index? Well, if you look at how well the market index tends to rank on on the funds, you, you, you wouldn't say this, of course, because uh, quite often the market is in the top quartile. And uh, I think that's why many investors have, in fact, moved to passive investments. Of course, it's very low cost, which is, which is helpful. It tends to be very low turnover, which could be helpful from, from, a, from a tax point of view. And, uh, and, and, and as I said, many active funds, especially after fees, have not managed to beat the, the, the uh, cap-weighted market. And so it is kind of astonishing, actually, that when you can do a backtest of, of randomly selected portfolios, that they often look like they should beat the market. Um, of course, you have to control your transaction costs very well. But ultimately, if you look at what would be in a random portfolio, you're typically going to be overweighted small stocks. Uh, the reason being, if you think about uh, what I said previously, you've got, for example, in the S&P 500, 50 names out of 500 are large in the sense that the top 50, the total cap, is roughly half of the overall capitalization. And so if you just select a stock at random, you've only got a 10% chance of getting a mega cap stock. And you have a 90% chance of getting a less than mega cap stock. And so you're probably going to have a significant size bias. Then, of course, we get into the debate whether the size premium is driven by the properties of the stocks or the portfolio. Stochastic portfolio theory actually allows you to analyze this exact situation and predict that you should see outperformance of a random portfolio. The question, though, is do you actually have a higher Sharpe ratio? And that's not always clear. Probably you're going to be taking on more risk. Uh, and I don't think investors would really stomach the level of randomness. Uh, there's, there's enough uh, randomness in investing that people don't want to admit. If we now double down and say we're going to run a random portfolio, I don't think you'll have many takers. That's not going to be the new ETF, is it? Probably not. Well, certainly I can tell you that it's not on Intex radar to launch one of these things anytime soon. But maybe we'll look at it now that you mention it. <laughs> so we talked about a, a number of different um, premia. Um, there, there has been some debate about whether you should uh, always have a well diversified, balanced allocation to all premia, or whether you can do a little bit of timing on the, on the side of it. And I think this has been especially uh, been a debate between uh, Rob Arnett and Cliff Esnes. And I think uh, they've changed their opinions slightly in recent times where um, Cliff now says we should sin a little. So maybe do do a little bit more value um, investing or, or up the value premium. Where do you stand in, in the timing debate? Should, uh, can you time factors? I think it's very difficult. Again, my hat's off to anyone who can successfully time really anything. Um, I tend to think of timing as two, there's two different ways you could time something. There's the almost impossible and then there is the possible. But uh, let me uh, distinguish between those two. So uh, if you try to time the top or a bottom of anything, it's extremely difficult to pick. So... If, for example, there was some premium, say growth versus value, so value is a premium, but it's been out of favor for a long time, a few moments in the sun, but uh, when, when will value come back? It's a very good question. Uh, will it ever come back? Well, if you actually tried to time the top of growth, uh, that would be fantastic if you could actually pick it. Even if you picked it to the nearest quarter, that would, that would be really great. Uh, and I think it's extremely difficult to do. 
If you look at something like momentum, that's much more choppy. That that has times uh, where it really goes on long runs of beating the index, and then fairly short and savage uh, downturns compared to the cap weighted index, where it gives up a lot of the gains. And we've seen quite a quite a few of these incidents in the last few years. So if you could pick again the top and the, the bottom and know when to get in and out that would be the sort of timing where you could really do fantastically well. But I think it's very difficult to do. Um, so if you ask, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. If you ask, can I do it? I don't think I can do it. On the other hand, the other sort of timing that's interesting is what I would think of as risk timing. Can you assess when something is a little riskier than normal and then maybe be less exposed to it there? And I think that is possible. I think there are a number of examples because risk, volatility tends to be a bit more stable where you might take a point of view, it's too risky to be too exposed to this now. I will probably miss the last run up, which could be quite, uh, you know, giving up on some return. But in exchange, I will miss the big drawdown. Now, you don't know when it's going to happen or else you'd be in the first case but I do think it's possible to work out when some of these exposures are, uh, are more risky as long as you can accept that you will miss some upside, but you hope to compound your way through, miss some of the upside, protect against the downside of that factor or exposure, and you should still come out ahead. Maybe not as ahead as you would if you could pick the top or the bottom, but uh, from a sensible diversification point of view, I, I think it is possible to time factor risk exposures. Okay. I don't know what Cliff uh, or Rob Arnott has to say about any of this, by the way. Uh, you know, um, this is, this is uh, I, I live in a world steeped in volatility, which is perhaps a lot less exciting than trying to predict things going up or down. But, uh, you know, slow and steady wins the race, I suppose, is the cliche there. Now, a lot of the research in systematic strategies is, is sort of based in academia. And you were for a, a long time a lecturer at Princeton as well. Sometimes we get a bit of the criticism from uh, people in the industry that academia is it's, it's too detached from sort of practical investment strategies. Um, some of the assumptions they take are just not real life assumptions. But then on the other hand, I also come across criticism um, about practitioners where they say a lot of the investment industry seems to be based on anecdotes. There's no real fundamental reason why they do the things they do. They just always have done them that way and that's how we're going to continue that way. How do you see with having a foot in uh, either camp, how do you look at, at bringing those two parties closer together? Yeah, no, I think this is a this is a great topic for discussion. The the role that academia can play um, in in uh, in industry and and vice versa for that matter. Um, uh, I see some connective tissue in certain areas, and and I actually have worked with a lot of people in mathematical finance, and that those are uh, academics who who really sit in mathematics departments uh, rather than economics or, or business schools. And they are interested in solving difficult maths problems that happen to be inspired by problems from finance. Uh, but sometimes they end up being so abstruse and uh, really uh, become quite disconnected from any applications. So um, I think there is, there is some feeling that perhaps that part uh, needs to be uh, connected more. And, and, and actually, as, at, at Intech, we, we, as you said, we regard the sort of academic connections as in our DNA. So we have every month a number of academics in mathematical finance come to our investment office uh, and uh, we talk about we talk about theory, and uh, we we have on our on our staff uh, at Intech uh, a joint appointment, uh, Professor Yanis Karatsis, who is also at Columbia University, right? So from that mathematical finance aspect, uh, we we do have some pretty deep linkages. But if I look at how much they seem to talk with economics or business schools, there, there's often quite a bit of a disconnect. 
And I could see how a lot of what goes on in the investment world might be viewed by the academics as, as essentially just uh, continuing traditions that don't necessarily make any sense. Um, the investment professionals are steeped in a world which isn't theoretical. Uh, the markets do evolve. There is nothing that says that prices have to do anything or markets have to do anything. I reject all models that say I'm right and the market is wrong because the market is always right. And if you don't agree, well, guess what? The, the market is, is right. Uh, uh, why is it right? Well, that's a very good question. Very difficult to study. Um, but I do think that both groups could actually talk more, learn from each other, accept that the academics are better at making models and the industry people are better at understanding what clients need and how markets function on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's always just nice to see when collaborations produce interesting research. So, you know, for all of that, I I've seen a number of papers that I've said, gee, that's really nice. Look at who the authors are, some sort of industry person and an academic person. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the sort of uh, the goal that we all strive for in there. So what are some of the more interesting or exciting discussions that you uh, potentially currently have around the application of mathematics in, in the investment theory? Right. So we are always interested in trying to understand these portfolio level effects. Um, again, it's a different way of thinking. You say, I'm going to accept that I can't say very much about any individual stocks but I might still be able to say something about a portfolio or a market. And uh, one of the things that I've mentioned is, for example, that the top 50 stocks in the S&P typically occupy around 50% of the capital. But it's not always 50%. Sometimes it's a bit more. Sometimes it's a bit less. It's very interesting that it hasn't really moved very much over the years. right? If you look at the top stock in the S&P itself, then it could be Apple, it could be Microsoft. It, it, it was General Electric ages ago when I, when I started actually at Intech and before that IBM and so on. Uh, but the interesting thing is it never really occupies more than 5% of the S&P. And the question is, why not? Uh, why is the market so stable when the individual stocks can be quite wild and move around? But macroscopically, if you forgot which stock was which and just looked how, how big the biggest one is and looked at how big the, the second biggest and so on, you find that that sort of distribution of capital, it's pretty stable over multiple decades. And so it's always just an interesting question to come up with a model for individual stocks that somehow uh, when you aggregate it, shows that sort of level of stability. Now, this isn't a new problem that we've been looking at. This is something that we've been looking at for a long time, trying to understand it, um, because that sort of stability really does drive things like the size premium, if you want to call it that, right? I mean, for example, if you invested in the top 50 and the top 50 grew to 90% of the S&P, which has never happened, but if it did happen, Forget about the trading, the rebalancing. You get you get lost in the in the dust. You left left behind uh, because the 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 uh, the top fifty would be so good to hold them. And it actually happened in Finland for a while, where the top stock Nokia did actually grow to 90 percent of the Finnish market. Um, so all of this stuff can be studied mathematically. And recently we've been applying some machine learning techniques uh, to it as well. So I always find this fascinating that investors somehow individually are hard to predict, but collectively the sort of average of their behaviors is, is, is easier to predict somehow. So you mentioned the machine learning as well, and I, I saw that uh, quite recently Intech has appointed a chief data scientist what are your expectations around that field? Because there seems to be a lot of hype around it. Um, but at the other hand, it's also it's a different environment with the amount of data that's available. How do you use it in your process? So we've always viewed machine learning as a nice uh, research tool, but we have not integrated it directly into our process at this point. I don't rule it out, but 
we like to understand things and we will use different research tools to try to gain that understanding. It's hard to understand anything really well. We have to admit when we look at it that there's very few things we really do understand. There are a lot of observations we can make, but if we want those to be valid in the future with high probability, then we should try to apply the scientific method and come up with an explanation. Actually, ideally, you'd have a theory first, you'd make a hypothesis, and then you'd test that hypothesis, and if it's confirmed, then your theory is still good for now. And if it's not, then you have to work out how to modify the theory so it can accommodate the new evidence. So this is the scientific method, hopefully, in a, in a nutshell there, and it can be applied to investing, and we, we try to do it. Uh, machine learning is a wonderful tool to augment that. Some funds have put it in very much directly. Uh, as I said, we're not, we're not there, and I, it's not really on the radar, but we do think that improving our research in those dimensions, given the availability of so much alternative data, uh, might give us some insights into, for example, how to trade more effectively, how to understand whether that 50% ratio that I mentioned of large to small, what's that going to do in the future? You might even be able to have some mild predictions of that. Um, and so the way we're looking at it is that our new chief data scientist, who happens to be an Australian, by the way, uh, is, uh, is going to really help uh, increase our, our ability to apply these machine learning techniques and, and also, frankly, access intelligence outside the, for, uh, the firm by crowdsourcing research. So it's very exciting, uh, the extra connectivity and the huge rise in the number of people who have become conversant with machine learning through, through the availability of open source packages, online courses. The internet is available in, in developing countries where there are bright young people who otherwise would never be on your radar. Uh, just that, that notion of accessing the, 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 uh, the greater intelligence, hopefully for the good of at least Intex clients to start with, and uh, we'll see from there. But uh, yeah, this is, this is very compelling. What, one of the in aspects I find particularly interesting is that where machine learning potentially might come up with the most interesting results is in sort of nonlinear patterns. And there have been some some promising results in that area, but it's also the most problematic area to from a fiduciary point of view because a lot of these type of strategies they're just not designed for the human brain to understand. So you might come up with something that works really well and, and it takes it out of that sort of linear thought process, but then how do you explain what the machine actually does? Have you come across issues where you had potentially interesting results, but were completely unusable for, for those type of reasons? We have had these sorts of instances, but I'll tell you, we've had them whether or not we used machine learning. Uh, it's quite easy to do some experiments where you observe something incredibly interesting and say, wow, that looks like a great thing to put in the investment process, except I have no idea why it works. Uh, either I take the time to try to understand it, could have just been random chance. It just sits in the data, sort of like that uh, idea that knowing who wins the Super Bowl predicts who's going to win the next election. I mean, you know. Spurious we, correlation. Probably, right? I mean, correlation versus causation. This is the tough part. So uh, we've rejected things from, from uh, let's call it um, not artificial intelligence, biological intelligence to the extent that any of us at Intech have it, and I hope we have some. Uh, you know, you can reject it if you don't understand it. You just have to decide if you want to take the time. So some of the machine learning ends up uh, giving you some black box stuff, which is impossible. Uh, but there is, there is a branch called interpretive uh, machine learning where you really, uh, you might sacrifice some speed or some accuracy, but you are better able to explain what is going on. And so we view what we're going to be doing as much more into that latter category where we are prepared to reject findings that we don't understand and invest time in other research to try to understand them. So I think from the fiduciary point of view, uh, we should be okay. Of course, uh, we're very careful about these sorts of things uh, and we don't put things in that we don't understand. But in terms of linearity, I should say our whole investment process 
is based on the thesis that compounding is inherently nonlinear, right? I described before, 25 minus 20 is not 5. It could be 0 in the case of compounding. And so our whole uh, investment thesis is you can exploit the nonlinearity, which makes it difficult, of course, to analyze. But then maybe it's an obvious connection to use methods outside of linear methods, of which machine learning is one, to try to gain a research edge. Yeah, I like the term biological intelligence, but it also made me think of um, behavioral aspects that come to investing. And we talked a lot about systematic strategies with a lot of ways where you measure how the market behaves from sort of one step removed from the participants in the market because the market itself is made up of a lot of different actors. They might have different interests. And, and some of that is purely driven by the type of organizations they work in, but others are more behavioral. Do you take those type of things into account as well, uh, behavioral finance findings of investing? It's certainly interesting. Um, I think that everything is behavioral in, this, in that sense, right? The uh, the market is a collection of, of trades, essentially, that are being done uh, by people who do have different preferences. Uh, otherwise, they probably wouldn't bother with the trade, right? So not everyone should have the same preference, and these preferences will change over time. There are certain aspects of behavior that will never change called human nature, if you will, uh, but then there are things that do change over time. There, there are fads, there are, there are uh, increases in knowledge or, or sometimes decreases in knowledge, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just find as a scientist, it can be challenging for me to say, well, this anomaly is behavioral. I say, okay, sure, everything is behavioral, um, but what does that really mean? So I want to turn the net behavior into a mathematical model and say that's going to statistically describe the general behavior. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's sort of like saying, are you an economist or are you more of a quantitative person? Well, I respect economics. I respect behavioral finance. I have a bit of a disconnect about how to use it. It doesn't mean that it's bad. I'm just looking to aggregate it and try to model it statistically, whatever it is, because the stock price movements are not driven by physical laws. Even if we want to apply physics techniques to understanding, uh, they're not molecules in a, in a box, right? <laughs> this is, these, are, these are trades that real people are doing. It's just that there's a lot of people and they behave in aggregate in somewhat predictable ways, how can you measure that, model it, and build a portfolio that takes it into account? So it's all about building a well-thought, comprehensive model. That's what we try to do, at least at Intec, right? We come from a science background, uh, have mathematicians, physicists, engineers. We're used to thinking about things structurally, not everything can be explained structurally. There are great opportunities for people to seize on inefficiencies in the market, try to gain informational edges about individual securities, take a view about something. I don't say that that's impossible at all. In fact, I think it is possible. I think it's very hard, and I think it's very complementary to what we do. And so I think that there's room in the ecosystem uh, of investing for highly concentrated stock picking, or asset picking strategies, for market timing if it's done well, factor timing. There's a there's a lot of room for that. Uh, we just try to stick to what we're good at, which is being as scientific as possible, trying to understand things, and building portfolios that uh, that reflect that understanding as part of the wider world. And we we hope that for our clients, it's a nice diversifier to their other approaches. Fair enough. Well, Adrian, thank you very much for this chat today. It was very interesting, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Australia. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much.